Hi, I'm Dylan. I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine, and I'm going to be talking about our paper, Reliable Post-Hoc Explanations, Modeling, Uncertainty, and Explainability. And this work is done with my co-authors, Sophie Hilgard, Samir Singh, and Hima Lakaraju. And it's a joint collaboration between University of California, Irvine, and Harvard University. Machine learning achieves impressive results across many different domains. This ranges from object detection to natural language processing to even biology. Though machine, le machine learning models achieve impressive results, uh, machine learning models can often fail in surprising and sometimes counterintuitive ways. And this is true even if they score well according to evaluation metrics. So one way models can fail is that they can rely on spurious patterns in the data. So if we look at this image here, the model learns to make predictions using the background of the image. Models can also exhibit harmful biases. Here we have an example of an NLP model that learns to associate the pronoun her with the profession nurse more so than doctor. And even though models may do well according to evaluation metrics, sometimes it's difficult to figure out that these error patterns are occurring. You'll notice in both of these situations that we can use post-hoc explanations to help diagnose the key issues. So on the left-hand side example, it's a post-hoc explanation, in particular Lime, that tells us the background of the image is being used by the model. And the same is true with the NLP example on the right-hand side of the slide. Two popular types of post-hoc explanations are called Lime and Shap. Both of these fall into the model agnostic local post-hoc explanation category. And they work by fitting a weighted linear regression using perturbations sampled in the vicinity of a particular data point that you wish to compute an explanation for. So if we look on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see a bold plus sign. This is the point we're trying to compute an explanation for. And both Lyme and Chap will sample a set of perturbations here represented as the thinner plus signs in circles. And then they'll fit a weighted linear regression using these perturbations. And both these methods effectively differ on how this weighting function is chosen. Although, although local explanations can reveal key insights into models, there's a number of routes uh, that they have drawbacks. So modeling the local decision surface is an inherently difficult problem. And many of these methods have difficult to set hyperparameters. It can be unclear when you've generated a good explanation. They're often unstable and reruns lead to different explanations. And sometimes they don't sample in the smartest way, uh, sample perturbations, that is. In this work, we're going to use uncertainty estimation to build improved versions of local explanations. So to see how some of these issues emerge on an actual example using a Lyme explanation within the Compass recidivism prediction data set, here we have two Lyme explanations computed on the same instance where we just vary uh, the hyperparameters of the explanation, in particular, the number of perturbations sampled. <clears throat> if we look across both these instances, we see that the most important feature changes. So on the left-hand side explanation, uh, misdemeanor charge is rated as the most important feature. And on the right-hand side explanation, female is rated as the most important feature. So you can imagine if you're a user of these explanations simply by comparing both of them in the form that they're provided, such as this, it'd be very difficult to figure out which explanation you should trust. Now, our key insight is instead of defining feature importances as point estimates, we're going to instead define them as distributions and recover uncertainty associated with the feature importance estimates. So now let's compare the left-hand side explanation to the right-hand side explanation. If we look at the one on the left-hand side, we can see that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with what's the most important feature. But on the right-hand side explanation, we can see that we're highly confident female is the most important feature. So this provides some insight as to how we're going to go about improving local explanations. And in particular, now we can differentiate cases like this and clearly see that female is the most important on the right-hand side. 
The construction of our method is based on converting the locally weighted regressions using both Lyme and SHAP into Bayesian locally weighted variants. So instead of defining point estimates for the feature importances, here represented as phi, we instead define them as distributions and place priors over them. We additionally include a way to specify whichever weighting function, um, whether it's the Lyme weighting function, the SHAP weighting function, or a different weighting function you're interested in using for your local explanation. This construction ensures that though the feature importances outputted by our method will be the same at the mean, we additionally recover uncertainty estimates associated with the feature importances. And we can compute the posteriors of our method in close form uh, due to conjugacy. Now, critically, our method reveals two key notions of uncertainty. The first is that feature importance uncertainty can be expressed using the 95% credible interval on the feature importance is phi. And the interpretation here is that the true value of the feature importances, or the one that will occur if we run to convergence, will be included within this 95% credible interval 95% of the time. We additionally recover a notion of uncertainty that has to do with the error of how good the local explanation fits the underlying black box model. We refer to this as the error uncertainty of the local explanation. And this can be expressed using the marginal distribution on the error term of our model. One initial question is the uncertainty associated with our method well calibrated. And this is vital to ensure that we can trust uh, the uncertainty estimates outputted by our method. So in order to verify this, we assess how often the 95% credible intervals include their converged values. And in particular, just to provide an example for one feature on the Compass Recidivism Prediction dataset, uh, this is how we compute um, this, this assessment. So we take with a small number of perturbations, here 100 perturbations, uh, this misdemeanor charge feature, we compute the feature importance and get the associated 95% credible interval. We then run with a large number of perturbations, here 10,000, and compute the final converged feature importance. And running, over, running this over many features and, many, and um, many data points, we should expect that this converged value should be within the 95% credible interval 95% of the time. So if we do this assessment across many different data sets, uh, both the baseline and base chat methods, um, as, well, as well as different data modalities, including image data sets and tabular data sets, in general, we see that the method is well calibrated. These feature importance uncertainties are close to 95. Now, you'll remember that one of the key uh, shortcomings of local explanations we discussed is that it's often difficult to infer key hyperparameters associated with these explanations. And in particular, it's very difficult to set the number of perturbations value, and this can have big effects on the resulting explanation. So instead of, uh, instead of requesting this specific number of perturbations value, uh, we instead allow users to specify uh, the more intuitive notion of credible interval width for each of the future importances. So we allow a user to specify, I need a 95% credible interval with width 0 0.01 um, for a particular data point. What our estimate will do is we'll compute what we refer to as a perturbations to go value. And to achieve this desired level of certainty, um, our method would output a specific number of perturbations that must be run um, in order to generate an explanation for that particular instance with that level of uncertainty. And this is very useful because instead of dealing with this less intuitive notion of number of perturbations, we can instead deal with the more intuitive notion of credible interval width. So how well does this estimate work? Uh, here we look at our perturbations to go estimate or PTG using the MNIST dataset. To perform this assessment, we consider a number of different desired credible interval widths. For each of these widths and for the test instances in MNIST, we compute perturbations to go for each of the instances 
and then we run the resulting explanations for the number of perturbations output by the PTG estimate. We then compute the credible interval width of the final explanations. So ideally its value should line up along the identity. The desired width should align with the observed width. What we observe in general is that the PTG estimate overall is quite accurate um, at outputting the number of perturbations necessary to achieve different desired levels of uncertainty. Now, one of the other um, shortcomings we talked about is that it's difficult or local explanations sometimes don't sample perturbations um, as well as they might could, as well as they could. So we can also use our uncertainty estimates to sample a bit smarter. Uh, to see how this works, let's just consider for a particular image explanation, this frog, that we have a sample of three different perturbations. So looking across these, we can use the posterior predictive distribution of our method uh, to get uncertainty estimates associated with these perturbations. So how sure are we that our local explanation fits this perturbation well? And in order to sample perturbations in, in a better way, we can select for perturbations that are higher uncertainty earlier on um, and thus learn how to compute um, these explanations more quickly. So our focus sampling scheme would select the highest uncertainty perturbation here. And running this um, using our baseline method on an ImageNet, on ImageNet data set, we in general see that focus sampling converges much more quickly compared to random sampling if we just inspect the error uncertainty as a measure of convergence. So for fewer, fewer model queries, we can get a more converged explanation. One interesting observation is it seems that focus sampling um, improves the stability of the resulting explanations. And here, um, by stability, I mean that if we take an instance and we perturb it slightly, how much does the explanation change? So intuitively, we would expect that if we just perturb an instance slightly, the, expo the resulting explanation shouldn't really change too much. So if we look at stability um, of the explanations across um, a variety of different data sets, using both the Bayesian and Lyman shell variants, in general, we see that the, the resulting explanations are quite a bit more stable. And what this indicates is that using focus sampling, because we, um, our explanations converge a bit more quickly, they're in general a bit more stable. Um, we have additional results in the paper related to a small scale user study we ran that seems to indicate Bayes-Lyme may have more meaningful um, explanations to people. So we encourage you to check out the paper for these full extended results. So in conclusion, I wanted to review a couple of the key um, useful aspects of our Bayesian local explanations that we discussed. So just recalling some of the shortcomings of local explanations, um, we, just, we talked about how it's difficult to set um, certain hyperparameters associated with the explanations and in particular, uh, the number of perturbations estimate. So to overcome this issue, we introduced perturbations to go or PTG, which given a particular desired level of uncertainty or certainty, will output the number of perturbations you need in order to generate a confident explanation. We also talked about how it's, off, how it's unclear um, when you have a good explanation and just inspecting the um, point estimate feature importances associated with previous local explanations, this is difficult to determine. So we can use our 95% feature importance credible intervals to get a sense about how confident we are um, associated with any given feature importance. We also talked about how unstable explanations are and how reruns may lead to different explanations. This really has to do with not computing like converged explanations and using credible intervals, we can get a better sense of how stable um, the explanations are. Uh, we, often, we also talked about um, the naive sampling schemes um, used in local explanations, and we can use our focus sampling scheme to do a bit better here. So thanks, uh, please reference the um, full extended work, and I'm happy to take further questions.